All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list. Today we're continuing concepts and principles with processes that promote emergent relations and generative performance. So far, maybe one of the more technical, complex ideas on our task list, and that's just because since the fifth edition, if, if you're familiar, they've taken ideas we know in a different way and kind of reclassify them into emergent relations and generative performance. So what we're going to do is show you why emergent relations is really just an umbrella where these other terms live and same with generative performance. And once we do that, we think it's going to clear up a lot and make this a lot simpler. As always, subscribe for all of our videos. We put out three BCBA videos a week plus our RBT content. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. If we are helping you, we ask that you share and let others know about our videos and resources. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Now, let's start with the general idea behind emergent relations and generative performance. The idea is these are two concepts that refer to the development of new behaviors or knowledge without direct teaching. And ultimately, that's what we're talking about. How do new behaviors, how do new concepts come about if we don't directly teach? If you've worked with kids before, or adults as well, you know teaching everything, every single skill, every single idea, every single concept just isn't possible. We don't have enough time. So how do these new behaviors and concepts emerge without us having to teach everything. This is what we mean when we talk about emergent relations and generative perform performance. So emergent relations are those stimulus-stimulus or stimulus-response relations that are not directly taught, but arise as a result of other learned relations. In other words, these relationships that form beyond direct instruction. And the most common idea is if I teach you A equals B, I don't have to teach B equals A. Hopefully, that relationship emerges. Generative performance, think generalization. We have these novel, untrained behaviors based on a learned framework. So you've already developed a framework of how to act or what to say in a certain situation. And now we have novel or untrained responses in those situations occurring. So how does or how do emergent relations form? Well, first, we're going to talk about stimulus equivalence. It used to have its own section on the task list, and it's probably the one you're most familiar with. Stimulus equivalence is the idea that emergent relations are formed when a set of untrained stimulus stimulus relations emerge as a product of training and reinforcement of other stimulus stimulus relations. When we read definitions like this, this is when people get confused and their eyes glaze over. Let's simplify that. What are we talking about? These stimulus stimulus relations. Well, let's look at reflexivity. A equals A. If I show you a picture of a dog and you select a picture of a dog, then A equals A. That's a stimulus-stimulus relationship. Very straightforward. Let's think about symmetry. We just talked about it. A equals B. I show you or teach you picture of dog A equals spoken word dog B. Now, due to that relationship, this emerges. Spoken word dog matches picture of dog. So the idea has just flipped. That simple. Transitivity is true stimulus equivalence. Now, let's follow along. If I teach you about a picture of a dog A equals spoken word dog B, and I teach you spoken word dog B equals written word dog C, we don't need to teach the next two ideas, or we shouldn't teach the next two ideas to get true equivalence. You might have to, but that's not true equivalence. That's not a true emergent relation. Remember, these are untaught relationships. What's going to emerge now that A equals B and B equals C is that A equals C 
and C equals A. So these very simple ideas of these stimulus or these stimuli are related. We teach that. And these other relationships are now formed throughout the initial teaching without us having to go back and teach every single relationship. Second idea, relational frame theory. This is even newer to me, and it's still growing and being developed. Now, should you be familiar with what it is? Absolutely. Should you spend a lot of time on this? Not unless you're fluent in everything else, right? It's a newer idea. There's still a lot of research being done, new research, but let's be familiar with what relational frame theory is. In essence, it's proposing that humans learn to respond to relationships between stimuli. So a tree is bigger than a blade of grass. Chocolate milk is the same as white milk. Just follow along, right? They're both milk. Uh, dark is the opposite of light. So we're looking at these relational frames and we're responding, we're responding to the relationships based on those frames. And just like stimulus equivalents, we can then form untrained relations. So some relational frames, sameness or similarity. We start to group things by how, how similar they are. We also group things by the opposite and different they are. Bigger, smaller, better, worse. Before, after, whole part includes is part of. Hierarchies, we are putting all these things into these frames, these mental frames, and then forming relationships. Now, how in practice do emergent relations form? Well, let's think about a child who learns opposite, right? Hot, cold, up, down. Well, now what if they apply it to quiet, loud, without direct teaching? They've taken that frame, and now they've identified more opposites. If you want to look in Cooper, they go into much, much, much more detail. Again, once or while you're studying for your exam, I don't recommend going down this rabbit hole. If you feel 100% fluent or once you pass your exam, definitely go read up on it. It is very interesting. But for the purposes of this, I don't recommend diving too deep just yet. Not until you pass that exam and you are practicing in the field. And then generative performance, which I think is a little simpler because we're really thinking about generalization strategies. Processes promoting generative performance that include teaching loosely, programming, common stimuli, multiple exemplar training. If you're familiar with your generalization strategies, all three of these help generalize because that's essentially what generative performance is, getting these novel responses to occur. Teaching loosely, we're varying non-critical aspects of the instructional environment. If one day I put out red dots for my students to sit on, and the next day I put out blue dots, that is teaching loosely. The dot color is not critical, but we're avoiding non-critical stimuli, developing stimulus control. Programming common stimuli, incorporating stimuli from the natural generalized environment in the teaching setting. If I'm teaching someone to order at a restaurant, I want to make my teaching setting just as much as as similar to that restaurant as possible. What is common about that restaurant that I can incorporate in my teaching? And then multiple example are training, teaching a skill or concept using a wide range of examples and not examples. Let's say back to the ordering from a restaurant example. The waiter may say, can I take your order? What can I get for you? Are you ready to order? The menu, there can be several different types of menus. So we're looking at all kinds of examples while trying to program stimuli you might see in the environment, and then teaching loosely by varying non-critical aspects. And what we're trying to do is generate novel, untrained behavior. So key takeaways, emergent relations occur when an individual demonstrates untrained responses after being taught specific related stimuli. So like we talked about, if you learn A equals B and B equals C, then you can respond that A equals C based on that relationship. Generative performance, the ability to produce new untrained responses based on previously learned skill or relation. So these untrained responses allows learners to apply known concepts across novel situations, reducing the need for us to teach every single situation and every single behavior, which just isn't possible.
All right, thanks for watching. I think that's about as simple as we can make it. You wanna keep these concepts simple at first, not just to pass your exam, but as a new, new practitioner, you wanna to start to simplify things for you, for yourself, right? You may be overwhelmed and you may have a bunch of clients you need to help and develop treatment plans for. You wanna keep things simple at first. Don't get bogged down too much in the details until you're comfortable with some of this high level information. As always, like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com. When you pass, let us know. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.